Okay. All right, man. Okay. Okay. <laughs> How you doing, Billy? Good to see you. Good to see you too. How's yeah. everything? <laughs> very good, very good. I uh, I just saw Victor the other day, and we were mentioning how much fun we had uh, working with you. Right, right. <laughs> it was yeah, cool. That was awesome. Yeah, there was one uh, piece, one line that was not the standard uh, Western music type of a line. But I remember when I recorded it, I took a little snippet of it and posted it, and people were uh, were uh, pretty impressed with it uh, with your your composition. It's tough yeah. to play. It was one of the, the one of the two toughest things I've had to play uh, in the last couple of years. Your record, and then a young lady from Japan too. So uh, <laughs> you guys are you guys are tied for first place. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm I'm really glad like how it came up and how everything sounds. So I'm great. It's really good. I appreciate it. Well, it was a joy to work with you. We'll do it again anytime you want. Okay. Okay. Ellen, how are you? Welcome to the Sunshine Show. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's so, it's so nice to see you. I know that we actually got to meet Saturday during a really cool bass form, and I just, I get so starstruck every time I see you. <laughs> Thank <All right>. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think of Mr. Billy Sheehan over here? Is he one of your biggest inspirations as a bass player yeah because uh since he was actually contributed in my father's band um mm -hmm. yeah now go 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 <laughs> my dad's band um i actually uh, got to see a lot of uh i got to see a lot of things from him a lot of concerts a lot of well not live but <laughs> Well, you also got here. to see him right here in the studio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I've seen pictures of you guys together. Like, what? How do you? How does it feel to be able to hang out with such amazing superstars? Being only nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. <laughs> Very cool, very cool. Ellen, so tonight we're doing a really cool session with Billy and we're asking him questions and we're taking questions from the audience. Do you have any questions that you want to ask Billy or any kind of advice you might want to ask him? How did you meet my dad? <laughs> Say again, what was it? How did you meet my dad? Uh, you contacted me, I think, through Victor, didn't you? Right. Yeah, we're both uh, friends with Victor Wooten, and uh, Hovac was working with Victor, and so he wanted to get in touch with me, so Victor had my phone number. He was kind enough to get us together. I'm glad he did, and the first recordings we did, we did over at Victor's home in his home studio, and that was good because I'm glad I was there with your dad because some of that music was pretty complicated, and uh, I needed some, some of his advice here and there on what exactly he wanted, mm -hmm. but it was a wonderful challenge to play uh, music out of my normal, what I normally hear. And it was quite awesome, uh, really wonderful. I, it was a joy to work with your dad and uh, maybe we'll get to work together someday too. It'd be wonderful. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's gotta happen, definitely. Right on. Also, out of out of all of the bases right now in your studio, I can see right now, uh, which one is your favorite from out of them? I'm curious. Say again, I didn't get it. Um, which which bass guitar is your favorite out of uh, out of all those? Out well, of this all one here, this one here has what I call a squiggly frets. I don't know if you can see it, but the frets aren't straight. They're oh. wiggly, and it's done like that, so it's perfectly in tune all the way up and down the neck. And it's made by a company. This this fretting is done by a company uh, in Sweden, uh, True Temperament, I think it's called. And uh, so I use this when I'm here in my studio recording a lot because if there's keyboards, well, other fretted instruments, they seem to work well together. But when there's keyboards, it's something that's tuned much better than a fretted instrument. This seems to work well with it. And we've had a lot of trouble with tuning when people send their track to me. They're not always tuned exactly right. And it can be a, a, a real difficult thing. So we try our best to lay down completely, totally in tune. Then they can fix themselves later. But in this room here, I have a, there's one bass I'll put, man, it's this bass right here where my finger is, this guy. That's the white? 
That's the original from uh, my first bass, and it's uh, it still plays great. And it was, uh, I think it's, uh, the neck is a 68, 1968. And when were you born, Ella? Uh, <laughs> 2012. This is old enough to be your great grandfather, I think. <laughs> and it has all original wear. There was, I know a lot of people purposely wear their instrument down, but this all happened 100% natural, playing in clubs every night. And Tell her what you call it. I refer to it as my wife, but now I'm married, so this isn't my wife anymore. I mean, it's my base wife, but my wife is uh, is much prettier than this, trust me. <laughs> but she's beautiful in her own right anyway, this uh, bass here. So I played thousands of shows on this bass. And it's, uh, and if uh, I don't advise you to do this, but if you were to lick it, it's salty from so much sweat. <laughs> so it's... Uh, it's uh, quite a quite an artifact. I've been uh, a lot of people have made uh, imitations of it, copies of it, uh, and uh, it's been on the cover of Vintage Guitar Magazine and in the fold out of Guitar World Magazine. So it's a pretty famous piece. That's and a museum piece right there. It's really a really. This is probably my most valuable possession I have. I mean, as far as my personal value, this is yeah. the thing that's most important. If we if, if there was going to be a catastrophe, I'd probably run down, grab my passport. And grab this <laughs> to make sure. I got it. So that's the most important one I have, and uh, there's a lot more. So when you and your family come to uh, visit Nashville, ever you guys can come on over, and I'll show you all my bases. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully when uh, when the base camp is open, we'll we'll yeah. find the big big oh, camp. Oh, great! That'd be great because I'm not too far from there. Uh, yeah. It, it, well, you've been there. Have you been to the camp, Novak? Not at the camp. No. Yeah, it's great. It's amazing. He's got all these buildings and stages, and I just donated a bunch of amps to him that Harky, uh, I had some Harky stuff here, and I asked him what they wanted me to do with it, and, mm -hmm. I, and they suggested why, why not donate it to Victor's camp, so I did. And uh, so he's got lots of amps there for you to use. So, yeah, it's a great, great experience. And uh it's a uh, Victor is a just a spectacular host too. You'll you'll yeah. love it. <laughs> How fun! Oh my gosh! So Billy, have you ever changed those strings? We have a, a question in the audience here. Yeah, I I change strings a lot when I'm playing live. Uh, it's got to be every night, and about and sometimes on big festivals where it's real hot and sweaty. Two or three songs in, the strings are soaked already. So and they go they go instead of sounding like you know. They sound like nothing. So then 10 songs later, I got to do a solo on them and they're dead completely because they're just soaked in salt water. So it's a real challenge. So every live shows, every show gets a new set because they just, and plus you hit them so hard when you're playing, you know, it, and they, it bends them a little bit where the frets are and they go out of intonation. So every string, every kind of string does, but these are Roto Sound stainless steel. The, the, I've used them my whole life. John Entwistle, Getty Lee, Chris Squire, everybody used uh, Roto Sound. Even Hendrix uh, played Roto Sound guitar strings. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Very cool. And that's my preference as well, Roto Sound. Good. I'm glad to hear. I'm glad I to hear. I sponsored by them. So everybody go out and get you a pair of Roto Sound strings today. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see who's hanging out with us. We got Don McDaniel, Patricio. We got Megan Went, Leaf in the house. We have Ben Harris, Michael. We have David Pistorius, James. You guys, thanks for hanging out with us. Mike Torrin, James Gooding, Lindsey, Jake Schwartz. We got the whole fam, bam. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very cool. Oh, we got some people from Hawaii up in here. Aloha. Thank you guys for hanging out. If you have any questions for Billy, drop them in the comments. We will get to them as soon as possible. We have a question. Hey, Billy, what's the backstory? Oh, of the wife. Actually, you already answered that. Yeah, Alex. yeah. Yeah, it was my first bass I got. Uh, it originally had a rosewood neck. Like I pointed out, it's that one right there. It had a rosewood neck and it, uh, I saw Tim Bogert. I'm one of my probably my biggest influence of, of early bass players on the cover of the Beck Bogart and Apice, where he played a, 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 a it was a band with Carmine Apice, his vanilla fudge drummer and Jeff Beck. And he had what I thought was a P bass and a Telecaster neck. 
So I went out and bought a Telecaster bass, took the neck off and put that on my P bass so I could be like Tim Bogart. And the Tele necks are big and fat. And I like them like that and uh, more sustained and really just like a big baseball bat. So that's that went on there. Uh, the one next to it is the wife's sister. She, she doesn't come out much. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I used to have that on the truck with me all the time and any live shows in case anything happened with that. I think I only used it maybe once or twice. Now. But that is a Telecaster neck also. And if I have to refret one, I'll take swap them out and so I can keep the keep the. Uh, the wife base with a different neck. And then when it gets refretted, I'll do that. But I originally put a Gibson pickup in the neck position. And that's what we have here now on the attitude base is the same positioning for a big fat humbucker like pickup, like similar to the EBO pickup. And it's a super deep low end. So it's just that pickup alone. It's no high end at all. The, the Fender pickup. So the, the, the Fender pickup does all the articulation and harmonics. Doesn't have a lot of low end on it. It, it will do it if you want it to. And then the low end pickup has a separate output to a different amp. One low, one high. And it's not an uncommon thing. I found out many bass players throughout the years added that EBO pickup to their P bass or even jazz bass. Mel Shacker, famous bass player from Grand Funk Railroad, he had a jazz bass with a big fat EBO on there. I just saw... Uh, 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 Pink Floyd uh, bassist was that was that David Gilmore the bass player? No, he was a guitar player. And the bass player, do you remember his name? Roger uh, Waters. Roger Waters. Yeah, sorry, I apologize for mixing him up. But they showed his uh, P bass, and he had a big fat humbucker on there, same place. So it's not an uncommon thing for people to do to add that low pickup, and it split it to two amps. One does all the deep low one, another is the heart the articulation and that that's what was basically the model for the attitude bass was that original P bass. And it still plays great. Uh, I'm gonna use it on a, a few records coming up here pretty soon too. I got a couple records I'm working on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, fire it up. I'll have to change the strings. Those are the same strings that were on it you know, back in the nineties, I think was the last time I used it. So uh, So before Ellen was even born. Before she was even born. <laughs> Wait. So, so basically, how old are you? Me? Yeah. I'm I'm about a thousand. <laughs> so you're a thousand too? <laughs> Me? Or are you? Oh, no, I'm, I'm about five hundred. <laughs> no, I I know I'm older than your dad. And am I? Then I, I probably could be your grandfather. So I'm one hundred. Say it. If, if his is thousand, I'm five hundred. You're hundred. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm six. I'm sixty-eight years old. And I've been playing bass since I was, I don't know, about fourteen, thirteen, or fourteen. So I've been playing for a long time, over fifty years. I'm nine. That's a lot of. That's a lot of years. That's a lot of gigs. Probably five thousand or more gigs. I don't know how many records I've done, but. Uh, well, yours was one, Hovac, but uh, there are a lot of others. <laughs> when I, when I, uh, I think mine was the last one, right? <laughs> no, there have been a few since. Oh, okay. Here, here and there. We uh, sometimes uh, after the show, I hate uh, paid meet and greets where you got to pay money and then we sign you things. I'll do it because the band needs the money and being on tour is a lot of expense. But I always tell people I'll be out by the bus after if you have anything for me to sign. I'll do it for free, of course. I hate charging people. So, but they come with a, a, pile, a pile of CD covers this thick, and uh, some of the stuff I don't even remember that I played on. I was like, "Are you sure I played on this?" They go, "Yeah, it says right here." And uh, yeah, I guess you're right. I, I can remember something. <laughs> so there was there was a, a all those years. Uh, are, I, I'm glad that I'm 68 because I got to see Jimi Hendrix play. So there. Wow. My that first concert. Cool. That was pretty cool. Very cool. So Patricio says next time you're in Mexico and Monterey is going to buy you. Oh, he's going to buy and cook the steaks. You're welcome to his house. Fantastico. Yes. Gracias. Uh, I'm going to be in Mexico in uh, March in Mexico City. Uh, I'm trying to find the information real quickly here now. I can let everyone know if I can find it. Uh, Let's see. Here it is. It's going to be uh, Billy Sheen and Friends, March 4th at, uh, I don't know the name of the place, HDX Circus Bar uh, Avenue, 
uh, whatever, in Claveria, Mexico. Anyway, here's the, uh, I don't know if you can see that or not. Probably not. No, you can't. Sorry. But anyway, I'll post this. Uh, I'm going to be there. Uh, drumming, drumming with me will be a guy named Thomas Lang. who's was a great, great drummer. Okay. Uh, you, you probably heard of him, Hovac. He's really a great, great, great player. And uh, so I'll be uh, and a guitar player myself, and we'll be doing some singing and playing, jamming mostly, not an official kind of gig, but we'll have a jam, have a blast, be some great music. I'll hang out, take photos, do autographs. It'll be wonderful to be back in Mexico again. So if this gentleman can make it there in Mexico City on March 4th, uh, I'll be happy to see him. All right, you heard it here first, Patricio. I hope that you go and take advantage of that. Once again, I want to thank all of you guys for hanging out with me, Billy Sheehan, my co-host for tonight, Ellen and Hovac. It's <laughs> been a fun time. You guys, we're just getting started. Make sure to drop those comments in the comment section. Um, what band has Ellen's dad, uh, dad played in is a question. Oh, uh, the band called Octavision. Octavision. What kind of music do you guys play? Progressive metal. It's mostly instrumental, but we have two tracks with the one and only Jeff Scott Soto. Again, through Billy Sheehan. Great. I'm, I'm so glad he introduced me to Jeff. So could have been awesome. happier. <laughs> Great. Wow. And Alan, are you eventually going to play on one of your dad's albums? Hopefully. Say know. yes. Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite kind of music to play, Ellen? Probably five, disco, stuff like that, some soul and blues, a little bit of rock, not little, a lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Do you ever, have you ever seen Soul Train? That, that was definitely before her time. It's a show. Have your dad show it to you someday. It's a bunch of funk and a bunch of really cool dancing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Don Cornelius was his name as a host. Let's see. Ben Harris asks, you don't seem to have bases with br bridge pups. Too bright for your taste? Question mark. How about high mass bridges? Good question. He's talking about pickups close to the bridge, and a jazz bass has a, a, a pickup close to the bridge. For me, the P is kind of universal. It's uh, so it does pretty much everything. It does great lows and great highs. I use it mostly for highs, but it does both. And I wanted that deep low sound because one of my favorite bass players, aside from Tim Boker, was a guy named Paul Samuel Smith and the Yardbirds. And on the album cover for having a rave up with the Yardbirds, he has an Epiphone Rivoli bass, which is like a Gibson EBO, a hollow body one. And it has one big fat Gibson pickup on there. So I wanted that, the two classic sounds, the P bass sound and the Gibson sound. So I got them. I never, uh, one time I think I did have a bass with a, a, a jazz style pickup here. And I don't know why, but it seemed to get in my way. But I want to try it again, particularly because there's a new uh, uh, a set of pickups that I designed with DiMarzio called Relentless. And uh, they are just spectacular. We've had great uh, a review and response to them. Now, we did them in the P-Bass configuration. Everybody said, well, you should do a jazz bass Relentless. It'd be great, do a jazz bass, do a jazz bass. So sure enough, Larry told me for a long time, don't tell anybody yet. And so now finally he sent me the photo of the first ones in production. And they will do the Relentless pickup and jazz uh, configuration now. So I'm going to certainly put one in and uh, give it a shot. Uh, it's curved like the curvature of the neck and the strings. So super comfortable for your hand. It's it's all smoothed out. It's encased in sheet nickel, which uh, shields the pickup from all kinds of noise. And it's just a very high output yet passive uh, pickup. Uh, everyone I know that it has it so far loves it. So the J uh, configuration is coming soon. High mass bridges, most of the attitudes have a pretty high mass bridge to start with. I've experimented back in the day on my P bass uh, with a badass bridge. They were the first uh, uh, really kind of a custom uh, replacement bridge with a lot of mass to it. But I had to dig a hole and sink it in. The first ones, that's how you install them, which meant I had to cut a hole in the base. Oh, you, wow. can't see it. you can't see it now, but there, there's actually a, a, I had Valley Arts in LA 
fill that hole with wood and then put a regular bridge on there. I don't notice a huge difference. Uh, some people might, some people with better ears than I, uh, but I don't, uh, I, I, I think in theory, a high mass bridge is, is good, but um, also I, I have an acoustic guitar and I put some brass pins that hold the strings into the bridge and it kind of deadened it and it made it uh, kind of a smiley EQ curve. They a lot of low end, a lot of high end and not much middle. And I'm, I'm into the middle wood tones you know, so the bass sounds wooden. It sounds you get that mid-range thing. Uh, so I, I I haven't gravitated towards pickups that are close to the bridge. You can do the same thing by by playing because when you play down here, it gets bassier as you move to the middle. Wherever you pluck it is a different tone. So that pickup picks it up, picks up the tone of the string there, which is pretty bright. I'll give it a try, and when I do, I'll I'll do a full report online. Yep. Perfect. Okay, you guys, I did a total party foul. I'm so glad I have co-host because my my computer's about to die and I need to run to get my charger. So if you <laughs> want to take over for me for like two minutes while I run and grab my charger, that would be great. W could you do that for me, Ellen? Oh, me? Yeah. yeah. There you go. This I'll is be, it. I'll be right yeah. back, you guys. Or trial by fire. So, so, Ellen, did I see a photo of you with one of my bases in a guitar center? Yeah. <laughs> that was you, right? That was her. Yeah. How did you like that bass? It was big. It's a big <laughs> bass. Yeah. But it was kind of big because she's not used to full scale, but uh, it fit fit perfectly. Uh, right. She, she usually uh, is struggling with full scales, but on that one, she wasn't. Interesting. Yeah, and th that surprised me a lot. So... Right. Well, we should talk later. We'll, we'll get in touch with me later, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see what we'll see what can happen. You never know what can happen. But that, now, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, we did some scales, uh, some lines in the record I did with you yep. that that were not major scales, Western style. They had a couple of different uh, notes in the scale. Mm -hmm. You know the name of that scale? Uh, those are not particular scales. Uh, so I when I, this is this is what's happening. I am I know the theory, but I don't use it so much that I almost forgot everything. So <laughs> whenever, whenever I'm writing a, a, a line or a, some kind of riff, I just go by the feeling, you know? Yeah, that's cool. And yeah. although all, all the Middle Eastern scales are kind of in my blood, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, but oh yeah, uh, I just don't pay attention to if it's right or it's wrong when, when like in terms of theory you know I what i'm saying so yeah. i just i just write it if it if it feels right to me i just keep it yeah since you have that in your blood and you listen to that probably as a child and and that music is 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 kind of standard to you mm -hmm. uh it's natural for you to gravitate to those notes that yeah for, for me the major scale is pretty much everything uh is built around it but i do often use the uh harmonic minor it's basically the harmonic minor most of the time is the harmonic minor with the uh minor second yeah yeah so that's a now i uh i don't have them yet but i'm working out the mo the harmonic minor modes up and down the neck so i just so i drill right now i drill a major scale uh modes up and down the neck So I want to be able to get that much facility with the harmonic minor, but it's odd because there's a couple big stretches in there with the different harmonic minor modes. So I'm, that's one of my recent projects to, to work on. And for me, it's good because it moves me out of that major scale, which it's great to be in it. It's great to know what it is and it's really useful, but if you can also be stuck in it and not be able to get out. So when you force yourself, as I'm sure you know, you're an accomplished player, of course, and uh, uh, quite awesome uh, in your own right. So when you break out of that box, it's nice to come back to it. Yeah. Right on. It's How are you doing? How She's did it go? <laughs> it was good. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for helping me out. I had to run and go grab my computer charger real quick. Let's take a look at these comments. Jason Schmidt says, I saw 
Billy Sheehan at Moody Music in Garden Grove, California. It was a pleasure. He sat down with me and gave me a one-on-one. -on -one. I was in awe. Billy, it seems like you are just really humble and very generous and really supports your fan base and love to give back to the community. And I just love you for that and thank you. Oh, well, believe me, it's my pleasure. Everything I own, everything I have, my house, my car, everything comes from somebody buying a t-shirt, a ticket or a record. And I never forget that. And that's a, and I think, and any, anyone else, they can look at it in any way they care to. Uh, it's to, it's to, you're totally free to, but I've always had a, a great uh, debt uh, to return to the people that have uh, been so generous to me uh, to like what I do, come to my shows, buy records that I'm on. So I always appreciate that. And I love uh, my fellow musicians too. It's a, it's a, it's a, I have a, I always learn more <laughs> when I get done sitting down with someone, like someone will ask me a question and I have to explain it. And by explaining it, it solidifies it in your own understanding. Many times they say, if you know something well enough, you should be able to explain it to a five-year-old, even nuclear physics. So if you really know it really well, you should be able to explain it to anyone at any level. So sometimes when I have to explain something a little more complex, when I'm done explaining it, I know it better myself, you know, because I have to kind of remove myself from me and put myself in their position and be careful not to say something that they're not going to understand. You know, use some word or some some way of saying something that they'd never heard before and really break it down to them. And uh, it's a it's a it, it helps the the educator as much as those are being educated to really uh, put that out. And uh, I I've been blessed with uh, uh, some some wonderful success. And I like to spread that around, too. So when I can help another player uh, in some capacity, hopefully. Uh, he'll, he'll go on and, and do well. There's a couple guys that uh, that uh, years and years ago I sat down with or worked with, and they went off and they got in bands. They became did quite well for themselves, and you know I was very very proud of them for doing that because they it was it was an interesting thing that I I, I may have contributed to someone else's success, which makes me very pleased. Very very cool. Um, but other, other than that, I'm a I'm a rotten guy. You would hate you'd hate being around me. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh sure, okay. Uh, let's see, Chris Luna wants to know, uh, this one's for you, Billy, what's the weirdest thing you've ever autographed? Oh, gee, I've autographed cars. <laughs> cars. I've got, the guy had a car out behind the, out behind the show. No, I, I, I know, Hovac, I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> but but a, a guy uh, had his car out behind the show next to the bus. He goes, you can come over and sign my, my car. So I had a, a big magic marker and I put it on there and he sent me a, years later, he sent me a picture of it and it was somehow it still managed to stand there through the rain and sun and snow. So, but that, that was kind of weird, but I've, 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 I've autographed a lot of things uh, through the years. <laughs> um, this next question we have for Ellen, what was it like being on, hold on. It says, uh, I'm so impressed with Ellen and that she hung out with Steve Harvey. We love his new show. What did it feel like being on that show, Ellen? It was really cool how um, whenever we were flying on the airplane all the way to Atlanta, we we were battling each other in a game on the seats. <laughs> <laughs> and over there, I was, um, I kind of, I since my parents were asking, what would you do if Bootsy Collins uh, went on? Steve Harvey show like like what what if this happened or that happened and I started to suspect that it would happen but I would didn't suspect that Earth Wind and Fire would come. <laughs> How cool was that? Cool. Real cool, huh? Yeah. How <laughs> oh, great. Cool. Yeah. Yes, awesome. Man, I can't even imagine, you know, all the amazing things you are yet to see on your journey, Ellen. My goodness. Um, let's see. This is from Mark Markson's bass channel. Thanks, Billy, for your awesome YouTube series, How to Play a Cheap Bass Playable. Um, thank you, Billy, for those videos. I've also seen them. Great, yeah. I, I uh, went in my garage and I had a buddy of mine who he's a guy who videotapes my master classes when we have our master classes here in um, 
uh, Nashville at Lane Music in Brentwood. And we videotaped the entire uh, experience so that people can go back home and, and like sometimes I'll play an idea or an exercise into the camera for them so they can learn it later at home. And uh, so he came over and we did uh, how to make a cheap bass play great. And uh, I have these basses that I bought, the bodies and necks for $50 each, super cheap from a place called guitarfetish.com. And I had a bunch of leftover old pickups and bridges and tuning pegs and stuff. And I slapped it all together with the help of a gentleman in, in uh, LA, uh, Weston, as I think his name, and a great luthier. He helped me out because he did the hard parts because we had, I had to route uh, the pickups out and I don't have a router. So he did that for me and he did a spectacular job. So I slapped these bases together out of the cheapest parts imaginable. And I never really fine tuned them. So I thought, well, let me do it on camera so I can show people what you do to get a cheap bass to play great. So the bass was uh, a little over a hundred bucks and it plays fantastic. It plays really great. Uh, I did the uh, dual pickup thing like I, like I did on all my basses and uh, leveled the frets, adjusted the neck, got it all down and uh, it, uh, it's, it's quite nice. So I might, uh, I, I suggested to me to maybe auction that off for charity, that particular base. Actually, there are two of them. So I, uh, I'm, I'm gonna take, pretty soon I'm gonna go into my archives, which are quite extensive and take all the clothing, all the uh, things I wore in the Eat em and Smile tour on the cover of Guitar Player Magazine, uh, in some videos I did, all that like, stuff. like like your spandex and like your leotard yep. <laughs> got it all so it's all going to go on auction we're going to find uh we have a couple of uh possibilities of uh organizations we're going to donate the money to so uh that'll maybe i'll also include those two bases that i made the cheap bases uh that i made uh from the from the cheap parts so that's coming up pretty soon i'll announce it on my uh social media facebook instagram whatever so wow very cool uh, what about, we have a question, warm up routine before a gig. Yeah, I warm up a lot. I, I've been playing here almost all day today. I, uh, it's, uh, let me just turn this high down. I'll do uh, a lot of hand exercises. Uh, when I play, my, my fingers cover four frets and four strings. So it's got like a little box. That, I, that my one hand covers. Now, sometimes you extend that up one or extend it down one, or even the middle sometimes, but mostly it's those four. So I'll... I'll go, go all the way up, all the way down, time and time and time again. And that's just one pattern. I go reverse it, then go go that way, or just even on single notes. So my hand can get used to playing any note I can I need to play in any combination within that little box there, because when you play a a scale, let's say a D, uh, here's a D. I'll do it in the middle so I can hear it, see it on the camera. D major scale, those are all notes in that box. If I can extend the scale, those are all notes that are in that little box there. So uh, working, working out the patterns within that framework can help you later on that your fingers and muscles are capable of doing almost anything. So then when it's time for music and not practice and really make a good line between the two, a lot of people are playing finger exercises when they should be playing music. It's, it's, it's not the right thing. But when you get to playing music and forget about it, forget about all that. Now you've created this little machine here that can do anything you need it to do in any position anywhere on the neck. So that's the idea of my warm ups, so I do that. So then when I'm on stage and I'm actually playing, I don't think at all about what I'm doing. It's all instinct, it all, uh, it all, it all just happens. Sometimes I'm playing a, a complex song, I, I work hard to memorize it so it becomes completely natural to me and I don't have to think about it at all. So when I'm playing, 
I'm not thinking we're, we're, what note is coming next. I'm thinking about, you know, wonder what we're going to eat after the show, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's of, <laughs> stay away from thinking about that musical thing. Cause then you're, when I'm speaking to you now, I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm just speaking from the heart. I'm just talking. I don't have to stop. And you see sometimes people, uh, when you talk to them and they're, as you're talking to them, they're not listening. They're just thinking about what they're going to say next. Right. It's kind of, it's kind of annoying sometimes, you know, so, but if you can just speak freely from the heart, you see sometimes a politician or a public speaker and they're reading it off the, uh, off the teleprompter and you can tell it's not, it's not real. They practice it and practice it, and make it sound real, but it's not, but some guys, some public speakers can go up there and just, Hey, how are y'all doing? Well, here's what we're going to talk about today. And they naturally can speak. They don't have to think about it. They can do that. It's a very important thing. And music, very much like a language. Once you can play it without thinking, uh, it, I believe it has a different effect on the listener. The same way as if I was robotically talking to you now uh, or reading it off a paper so that you know what I was talking about, uh, it wouldn't have the same effect as me just speaking to you naturally from the heart without having to think it through, saying what I know naturally. Uh, and it's also, uh, there's, a, there's a matter of honesty too, because it's kind of hard to make things up or prevaricate or lie when you're, when you're speaking from the heart. That's why I know to catch people if they're telling an untruth, they're usually, they're blinking and they're stuttering and stammering because they're, it's, they have to, they're, they're thinking, how do I make this sound like it's the truth when it isn't? So I think that has something to do with music too, because uh, you want to be honest with your emotions that you're expressing to your instrument. And if you can do it without thinking, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's always a good thing. Now, I went off on a tangent there philosophically, but the whole idea is to just own every spot on that neck and every pattern that you do, and you own it by just doing it over and over and over. And that's what practice is for. You get the muscle memory, you have three uh, assets, your eyes, you can see if your fingers are in the right place, your ears, you can hear if you go out of it, if you're playing a major skip and you play, do it again. Nope, that's wrong. I didn't even have to look. That's not the note. So you have your ears to keep you in check, your eyes, and also your the memory of the muscles in your hands. So you can feel where you are, you can see where you are, you can hear where you are. And those three things together combine, you, you own the neck with those three assets, all three of them, and at that point, you are a musician and you are speaking to your instrument and you are speaking to the listeners in the way that I believe is uh, the most ideal way to communicate. Through the yes. language of music. Exactly. <laughs> I rest my case, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> what if uh, just thinking back to whatever you said, like um, whenever whenever you just said that some you speak to your heart, for example, you're just speaking to someone you don't like very much and they're just obsessed with you, talking to you. And then if you speak from the heart, that means that, yeah, you're gonna say something bad. Hmm, I'm not sure. Uh... But, well, I know sometimes we talk about playing music that you don't like. Did you mention that? I'm not sure I heard you right, my dear. Did I? Did you said miscommunication. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think we could turn that around and say that you can tell when somebody is not playing from their heart and uh, so. when it's very fake or contrived, then it's like you're, you know, you can tell because your yeah. heart's not into it. Maybe not everybody can tell, but a lot of people can. And it's a very funny uh, quote that originally I got from David Lee Roth, which is, once you can fake sincerity, you got it licked. Because <laughs> 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 sincerity is, is by its nature not fake. <laughs> so, uh, that, and that's the idea. Showbiz is an entertainment to some degree. You're going to go on stage and you're sick or you're mad or you're upset or there's a problem somewhere and you kind of got to, hey, how are you doing? Ever? We're inside, you're dying. Yeah, there's a little bit of that sometimes, but that is more presentation, I think. And and in music, it's a lot more honest because sometimes I'll be on stage and I'm, 
I'm a, I have a different mood than I did at, in the last show and it shows and I allow it because it's real. You know, I don't want to fake my way through and smile my way through. You know, I want people to have a good time. And generally on stage, everything is positive. If it's not, I get to the bottom of it and fix it right away. But uh, I think it's important to be honest with your emotions. And as a musician, as a player, uh, I think these are some of the some of the foundation uh, building blocks of it. Fair All right. Answer. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Let's see. We got enough. First of all, thank you guys again. I cannot stress enough how happy I am to be back. Uh, uh, this episode, of course, is dedicated to the one and only Mr. Oliver Edgar William Nelson. Um, we are bringing the show back for him, and we got Billy Sheehan, we got Ellen and Hovac in the house, and we have all of you at home. Thank you. Drop any questions you may have in the comment section. Um, we're all very, very much appreciated. I know that your comment is practice, and you guys are hanging out with us, so thank you. Uh, Mike Torn says, strength and vulnerability. The people fans always know. You got to be real. Very good. Good quote. Uh, we want to know, when is the next Hovac ellen collab? Very, very soon. We actually almost have it recorded. We do. Yeah, she, she recorded the bass. I need to record the, my parts, and then oh. we'll just shoot the video. So that's what, what you mean, almost. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear. Ellen, I'll let you take the next question. You want to ask Billy another question? Or only if I have a question? You you could totally pass it to your dad if you want him to ask the question. That's what dad's for, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. What would be your advice to the beginners who are just starting you know, uh, getting into bass playing or any, or any instrument. I'm not a beginner. Good. <laughs> well, I have a, I have a, what I think I've been doing a few interviews uh, over the last few months and I, I've boiled it down to a, a, a good piece of advice. I believe, I think it's a uh, tried and true. I think uh, the numbers add up and you'll see uh, when I explain it, uh, three things I think that are supremely important to any musician right off the bat. Get in a band, get in a band with songs. Now, Hovac, don't get mad at me. Get in a band with songs that you sing. Here's why. Run the numbers and look at some of the most famous, successful musicians in the world. And they were in a band. Maybe they went off solo later. They were in a band with songs and they were in a band with songs that, they, that somebody sung, either them or someone else. Paul McCartney, Geddy Lee, uh, Tim Bogart, Chris Squire, uh, Doug Pinnock, the long list of great bass players and guitarists and drummers and singers as well. Uh, when you're in a band, there's a special thing that happens. You have to bond, you have to work with each other, you co-create, you figure it out. And you get, uh, when the audience sees you, they see the sum of these four people. How many times you see, or however many they are. Uh, when one person changes in a band, the whole band kind of changes. It's not the same anymore. You know, one guy leaves and very rarely, there are some stellar examples of it when sadly when Bon Scott passed away and Brian Jones came in, ACDC had their biggest record. But I do believe a lot of those songs in Back of Black were written by Bon Scott, but I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so that was a contributing fact. But nevertheless, getting back to it, uh, when, on television, they have The Voice and uh, American Idol. They don't have guitar players, drummers or bass players. They have singers. It's all about singing. And I always tell uh, musicians in bands, uh, if, if you're going to be in the band, if, you, if you're going to be in my band or I want to hire you, do you sing? No? Well, I'm not sure because we, we, we need a two-part harmony, three-part harmony, four-part harmony. You know, we want to get as much singing in there as possible. Uh, uh, and plus, uh, you, I, in Winery Dogs now, three guys, we all sing. Richie sings. Mike Portnoy is a great singer. I sing also. I'm in there somehow. And... Uh, uh, in the original Talos is three piece. We all sang, uh, got all those harmonies together. The Beatles, everybody sang, even Ringo, and they and the harmonies were amazing. Uh, so uh, that's a big important factor. Now I know Hovac, you're mostly instrumental music, though you did do have some stuff with Jessica Soto singing, and I think 
you'll get a broader a broader range of audience with vocals it's just the, the way it goes there's okay. no re go ahead yeah that's interesting because this is the first time i'm actually doing instrumental but before this project I was in the bands with the singer, like full full time singer. Oh, great! Yeah, so, yeah. And, and that's what I mean. Once you're once you've been in a band with a singer, and especially if you get any kind of notoriety, yes, go off the side and do your thing, and you know, do uh, whatever you want. Uh, back in the day, you know, uh, I, I was always had the option. Hey, if I if I, I want to play the songs the way they're supposed to play, if I want to solo all night long, I can go do a solo record, no problem. But I'm coming back to the band with the singing in it because I know that's where the audience will be, and and that's what. Uh, so I think for a young player, getting in a band, super important. You're gonna learn so much about playing together. And bass players, Alan, you gotta play with that drummer. You gotta watch that drummer like a hawk and you follow everything he does and you match his notes and match that bass drum. Uh, and that brings a band solid together. Gives a good foundation for the guitar players and the singers. And uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. So being in a band is a, is a big help. I see guys on YouTube doing unbelievable stuff, mind blowing, but, it's them alone. I don't know if they have a place to go with that. I don't know if you could walk out on, at Hellfest or Don, Donington or some of these huge uh, uh, festivals they have in Europe with your bass and do that. And I don't know what the crowd's going to do. Right. I, uh, it worries me a little bit. But right. if you go out there, about it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go out there with a band and you got some songs and you're singing and you get a spot to do your thing, little concise thing. I know mine aren't so concise, but I apologize. But a little thing where you can do your thing, it's gonna have much more impact, I believe, than spending the whole night doing doing that. Now, that's only one man's opinion. I could be very, very wrong, and if I am, and if you can prove me wrong, God bless you, that's fantastic. I think I'm you're glad. absolutely right. Absolutely. Cool. Well, Ellen thank you. Ellen actually sings. What's that? Ellen actually sings. Did you hear her rendition of what was it, Penny Lane, Ellen, or? Yeah, yeah I saw that. You, didn't you play a Hofner bass for that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was great. There you go. You're on the road. You're on the road. You get a you get a band together and sing and play. It's the and it's so much fun. You sit around. I, I have a sit around the guitar. Have a couple of people over. Have a glass of wine, and we start singing Beatles and Beach Boys and Grand Funk and Three Dog Night and Hendrix and you name it. And it's a riot. It's, it's so much fun. And singing and playing bass is tougher than singing and playing guitar. Mm -hmm. Guitar, you can kind of just strum and sing. It's no problem. The bass, you got to articulate these little fingers and think at the same time. So it's definitely harder. There's a great uh, bass player, Esperanza Spalding is her name, I believe, out of uh, Cuba. Yeah. Wow. She's like two people split down the middle. One's a bass player and one's a vocalist. And Especially with the double bass. <laughs> Mind blowing. Mind yeah. blowing. So talented. So I, I envy uh, people like that, and they inspire me greatly to to uh, to to do better uh, my singing and playing. Because I always say, if you want if you want me to shut up on bass, give me a vocal part. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be playing all over the place, and, and then when I gotta sing, it's so I just hold that one note there. But yeah, uh, getting a band, getting a band with songs, getting a band with songs and singing. A band with songs and no singing—that's very possible too, and it happens. Uh, but we had a, a for a while there when there's a lot of guitar uh, virtuosos, Eric Johnson, uh, people of that nature, great, great, and beautiful, great music. But it was melodic, almost like singing too. It wasn't just all shredding. There was a melody to it that you normally do with singing. So a lot of guys that do that as well. I think that it, 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 certainly a valid. Uh, all music is valid, uh, w whatever style. And uh, and you may be a guy with a bass that could just shred all night long and go up on stage all by yourself and blow the blow the roof off the place. Woohoo! I'll be I'll be your biggest fan, absolutely. But I know if you run the numbers, man, you're getting in a band with songs and singing is a really uh, a great experience. It sets you up later if you do do a solo record. You you've got so much more vocabulary of what you can do and what you can express from doing that first. So. Anyway, that's my that's my my spiel on my uh, my advice, and I I, th I think like I said the numbers uh, add up. You go to some of the most successful, iconic Steve Harris, amazing bass player. He's in a band. He's in a band with songs. We're singing. Getty Lee. He's in a band. You know, uh, all of them were. Paul McCartney in a band with songs. We're singing. So, and I think I believe Paul McCartney is the richest musician in the world, except for Andrew Lloyd Webber. 
who well, is a musician, but he's more of a producer of plays. So I'm going to default back to Paul McCartney, a bass player who is the richest musician in the world. <laughs> Yep. You heard it here, guys. Be <laughs> the richest musician in the world. Just really get in on that bass plan. <laughs> okay, Ellen. Okay. 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 Girl. We have we're Ellen approved. <laughs> Ellen approved. All right. We got a question from Fred Achoa. Hey, Billy. What are your bass string gauges and brand? I think we kind of went over that. We know you play Rhodes yeah. down. It's Roto Sound. Uh, I probably have a set here somewhere. Let me take a quick look because I'm usually, no, I don't, uh, usually changing strings pretty often in the studio to keep them bright. Uh, the Roto Sound, uh, standard Roto Sound set is a 45, 45, 45, 65, 80, 105. And a 105. So I made mine a 110 because I used the, uh, I don't have it on the space, but I tuned the low. I tune often, I tune the low E down to a D. So get a super deep low and out of a low note like that, it's real handy. Tune it back up. So I went with a one, uh, 110. Sometimes they even use a 115 or a 120. Because even though it's a bigger, fatter string and it's harder to push down, it moves less. So you can actually lower the action, which compensates for the fact that it's a harder string to push down. And it becomes pretty much the same action later. On the high string, I went with a 43. It's normally a 45. It's not much of a difference, but it helps a little bit when you're having to do a real high. You get do a real high bend once in a while. So the strings, the tension of the strings from low to high, this is the loosest and this is the tightest. Mm -hmm. So if you make this one a little less, it won't be as tight. If you make this a little more, it will be tighter. So the tension between the strings is more even now. It's because as you're plucking, one string is stiff, the other one is flopping around. So it's kind of hard to control that low E string. Mm -hmm. With your fingers because it moves a lot when it's when it's playing but the g-string doesn't move hardly at all a little easier to play so tightening this up well uh, making this larger tightens it up making this lighter loosens it up so the balance is now a little bit more even in the string tension not exactly even i don't know i'm not sure what that would be like even whether that would be good or not i'm not sure but that was another factor in changing the two end gauges of the standard uh, RS66 Rotosound set, which is 45, uh, 65, 80, 105. Very nice. Very that's, nice. That's way too much information about strength. In it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. We will take it. All right. James wants to know, question for Billy. Have you watched Get Back, the Beatles doc, and how did you like it, if you did? I didn't watch it, but I've seen a lot of Beatles documentaries over the years, and I, my Beatles folder in my iTunes is massive. I have outtakes, demos of Sgt. Pepper, of the White Album, of uh, the Let It Be album, of uh, all their early years, their first times in the studio with George Martin, quick one, you know, uh, in the background. So I, I'm a huge Beatles fan, and I'm very aware of a lot of the things they went through. I haven't seen that as yet, and I plan to. Uh, the Beatles, when I saw them on Ed Sullivan, their first American debut on television, I think every kid in the world, in the USA, watched that show. Anyone between the ages of eight or nine and 30 saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And uh, I had older brothers and sisters because I was pretty young for that. So I managed to watch them on there. But I remember when I saw the Beatles on TV and the camera turned to the audience and all the girls were screaming, I said, I want that job. <laughs> that was my inspiration awesome thank you so much thank you guys all for hanging out we got about 10 more minutes and we got to wrap it up billy's time is very precious to us and we appreciate it so much Let's my pleasure
let's talk a little bit about muscle memory and the importance of using the shapes and the patterns and the scales to really uh, take your base level playing to or base playing to the next level. Good question. Good question. There, there are shapes. And uh, for me, there's only three shapes. There's a half step, which is two frets, or a whole step rather, sorry. A whole step was just two frets and a whole, half step is one. So the three patterns I use are a half step and a whole step, a whole step and a half step, and two whole steps. So if I play a major scale, only three patterns they repeat they repeat again and again once you learn the sequence and drill it drill it drill it you'll know every note of a G major scale or whatever key you pick and on bass it's way easier than on piano because you're in the key of G and you want to move to the key of A you just go like this okay I'm in the key nothing changes it, just, <laughs> it makes a lot on piano it's all different different white keys and black keys and it's confusing to, to me though a fretboard may be confusing to a pianist unless you're tony mcalpine uh so uh those patterns are essential for me to drill over and over and the patterns that they make up and down as you play it's kind of confusing on mine too oh man <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> now i don't know if you, you've seen a Tony McAlpine does like Liszt and Rachmaninoff a piano while his left hand is playing guitar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mind blowing. Pretty, pretty amazing. So yeah, that is great. It's, and again, the ability to split your yourself into, and a lot of times any average player is doing the same thing as the left hand is doing something on your right hand and they're doing two separate things all the time. So you, there is that split that happens in almost every player. Uh, but those patterns, drilled over and over when I do my master class so often I'll sit down with a guy and it could be a guy that's been in a band and even made records and things like that and I'll just explain to him do re mi fa sol la ti do there's a major scale do you know it up and down the neck no well here we're going to learn it and here's why every chord everywhere is combinations of those notes I, I remember seeing jazz guys uh guitar players like, do, 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 do. playing these chords oh, like, how in the world are they figuring out what those chords are there's a million chords and they're all over the neck and it's uh, I, way over my head i realized aha it's those all those patterns i just played it's component pieces of those patterns now it's not that simple there's more to it of course but that's the basis of where do the chords come from from the notes in the scale three of them usually per chord but they're all in there so learning those patterns up and down and when i do my master class i uh i i do that into the video so they can take it home i do it nice and slow from like and take it now they're also there with that there's different patterns too instead of just ascending is, or, or, So all different kinds of ways of playing just those notes in that one position going over and over and over again until you own it will really because you want to well bass players are playing walking bass well how, how are they getting those notes so the notes of a scale and you're just moving through them now of course it's not always that simple and there's ways of moving in and out of the scale that be for a more advanced player and with more advanced ears you move in and out of that scale to imply other things and turn the guitar player's chord into a different chord without him changing any notes by moving your root note around. The bass is a very powerful uh, position in a band because you can really change the the sonic sound, the sound of chords and passages by moving that bass note around. They can do the same thing with a different bass note, bass line underneath it. It sounds completely different. So right now, as I'm doing a lot of tracks in my house. We'll get we get some from professional players. It's great, some great stuff, and some from people that are just beginners that don't really know too well. We hear the song, we're thinking, "Hmm, what are we going to do here?" I'm not sure. Then, aha! How about this? Suddenly, just by adding a bass line, I'm not saying me or my bass line, but adding a bass line, suddenly we got a song there. We got it's sounding like 
like uh, uh, music now, where before it was just kind of a chords and a beat. So now we, so the bass is a powerful thing to make that happen. And uh, understanding do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, te, do, as simple as it sounds, man, it's just an incredible tool. And learning it up and down the neck uh, really will uh, help every player, I believe. And, and, and I still work at it myself and improve upon it, try different patterns. I was trying uh, in the key of B. Oops. See, I used my ear. I heard that. I heard the wrong. Just a different pattern of playing that major scale descending. Then once I did it descending, I thought, well, can I do it ascending? So let's talk. It's in there. Sorry. Uh, uh, I got to be a little more warmed up to play that properly, but just challenging yourself to, to play a thing. Uh, it's always kind of a good thing to do it backwards, do it the other way, go start at the bottom and go back up to the top. And sometimes you have to stop and think now, wait a minute, how in the world do I even do that? It's a great way to get more facility with your hands, be able to hear things better with your ear about what's happening on the fretboard and, uh, give you more ideas and sonically and melodically. So. I think I over answered another question again. No, I love I, I, doing that. I apologize. Perfect job. <laughs> perfect, Billy. Uh, James says the chord is what the bass player says it is. That's true. That's true. <laughs> we, we, all, we, would, we used to call it the secret note because I just go to a different note. The guitar, and that's why guitar players love, uh, uh, you know, guitar players playing an E minor. And you go. See, guitar players just like but by you moving it around it sounds like he's doing this amazing thing where he's just playing the same three notes over and over move that root note around that's a very simple uh version of that but that's the idea you move that note around it becomes a different thing this gentleman is uh, very observant and is uh with his commentary i appreciate that <laughs> all right you guys we're gonna start wrapping this up i have two more questions that's it it is okay over. i'll try to keep it concise <laughs> We've had such a great time. Ellen, are you having a really good time hanging out with us? Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a really cool oh. surprise to have you here. <laughs> um, I do have a question for you, Ellen. If not bass, what instrument would you want to be playing? Mm. <laughs> she looks around. <laughs> I hope there isn't an accordion in the room there. Another bass. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all bass. Good. That's cool. Maybe. Yeah, well, in the beginning, I wanted to play bass. Uh, the guy who I was my original inspiration, he was a bass player. I did learn guitar eventually. And for chords and songwriting, a guitar for me is a, a nice thing to write with. So I always advise bass players to know not only guitar, but drums. Uh, knowing drums is really a great uh, help for a bass player. Just to be able to sit at a kit and keep time, uh, kick drum, hi-hat, snare, keep time, maybe do a couple little things with the bass drum, maybe a tom-tom fill, maybe go to the right. But if you keep time and start to understand drums and drumming, it's going to help bass playing out. And if you understand chords and guitar playing, you'll, you'll know more what he's doing so you can enhance what he's doing, uh, put a foundation under him for what he's doing and, uh, and interact better. And then, then, and then, like I said, when you to get in a band, the number one thing, then you're working together with other players and it's kind of weaves things together. So it's a good idea to know more than your own instrument. Of course, you want to, you have to master your own instrument, but if you know more about other things and some great players that, that I know play a, a lot of instruments, they, they, uh, Richie Costin is a great drummer and keyboard player, singer. Uh, Paul Gilbert plays drums really well. Uh, uh, Steve Vai, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he's a much of a drummer or not. I thought, I thought I remembered him sitting down at Kitten 
but he, he knew what to do, you know? So these things, these are wonderful players and, and iconic players. And uh, they, 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 they do know more. Hovac, he knows a lot. The music he composes is uh, quite complex. You need to know who you're composing. You need to know the instrument you're composing for. That's why a composer in a, a symphony orchestra, he knows the clarinets, the, the trombones, the violins, the violas, the cellos. That's because I, I, I played violin for 11 years and I was in a symphonic orchestra, so. <laughs> there you go. So uh, you, maybe you'll back me up on my point there. The more you, you have to know those instruments and what they're capable of. I've played in bands with keyboard players that didn't realize that the low notes of the bass can't really be played super fast because it's going to turn into mud. And they'll send me a MIDI file of this low frequency. And I could probably do it, but it's not going to, it doesn't sound right. I and mean, it's just like, it's super fast. And there's not enough time in between those notes uh, to articulate what you're doing. Uh, and you know, I see when people make a mistake at what we're talking about, it becomes quite obvious because you, you, you need to know the instrument you're working with. So, Maybe Alan, you'll, you'll, your dad can show you some chords and then you play some, a couple drum beats. Of course. The, the instrument I'd probably play is either keyboard or drums. Keyboards are great to know because uh, there's, uh, most music is built around the keyboard as far as written music, the way the, way the keyboard is laid out. Uh, I don't, I can fake my way around a uh, keyboard. I don't I have no idea what I'm doing, but I can, I think I can play a, uh, Bad Company by Bad Company. I can play uh, uh, Sweet Jane by Lou Reed. And I can also play uh, King Kong by Frank Zappa. Those are my three <laughs> piano pieces. <laughs> nice. And uh, we have our resident tuba player over here, OK? Really? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I got cool. uh, Yeah, tuba. I marched sousaphone uh, and marching band, you know? Wow. Oh yeah, I can play the harmonica, the ukulele, um, all kinds of stuff. So I got mine here. Oh nice! <laughs> so cool. Like, I don't yeah. don't worry, I won't play it. I, I don't want everybody to start logging off. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got Tony Walters in the chat. He says beautiful advice, Billy. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Don McDonald, uh, Don McDaniel says, so stoked to have Ellen and Hovac join us with Billy. And Billy, you really are a great guy for sharing your time with us. Um, and I want to wrap it up with this last question. Um, what's your advice for struggling musicians, Billy? Life is really hard right now. Times have changed. Nothing is the same. No, it's a, it's a terrible thing. Uh, musicians are hurting, of course, but even worse are the uh, personnel, the bus drivers and the crew guys and the uh, lighting and sound. It's tough. So we've done everything we can, the guys I work with, to help them as much as possible. I, my engineer is a dear friend, and I hire him every day to come in and, and pay him to help me record things. Uh, so it's a tough time. But the great thing right now, as far as I know, the music manufacturers are – having some of the best years ever. They're selling more guitars and drums and keyboards and you name it. Uh, and so it's actually, so people sitting at home are getting back into music. So that's a good thing. I don't know to what extent actually, uh, but the signs are that uh, things are exploding. So to sit down with the guitar, even in the worst of times, will certainly make those times better. And like I said before, just sitting around playing, if I had a hammer, I'd have her in the morning. I'd have her in the evening all over this world. I would, uh, playing anything is fun. Have a have a beer or a glass of wine with your friends. and uh, Or some uh, water or a Sprite or a Dr. Pepper. Or whatever you want. You can get it. Water is good. You got to hydrate. I don't know if you're well hydrated, young lady. Very good for you. That's good. But uh, uh, it can really help to uh, push away the... Uh, some of the evil that's out there in the world, sad to say, there is evil in the world. There's bad things going on. There's bad people and bad situations and sad situations. And music is a universal language, the universal tool to overcome things. I, I've been incredibly honored to have people write to me and I keep a folder of all these emails. And there are literally are hundreds who said they were in bad way, considering ending their lives, uh, everything was going wrong and they listened to something that I had something to do with and it 
They turned them around, changed their point of view, and now they're back on their feet again, and it's okay. So as bad as it is out there, and it is bad, a lot of people are suffering. Uh, stick, stick with this, work with this. This is the universal therapy uh, for most anything. I am, I'm having a rough day. I'm having a rough time. I pull in, uh, especially when I lived in LA and the traffic was so bad, I'd get home. I go down to my little studio, pick up the bass and go. And in about 20 minutes, I felt I was starting to get normal again after being stuck in the horrible traffic. That's nowhere near the problems we're having now. But anyway, the same principle applies, I believe. Uh, and use the time wisely. We're home. I get more time to practice now that I have in ages, which is great. I got, I stick, I stick with my, my iPhone. I put it on selfie video. I set it up so I play my idea into it and I got hundreds and hundreds of ideas of different ways of playing things, song ideas, music ideas, uh, lick and riff ideas, fingering exercises, all kinds of stuff in here. So it's been a, there is a bright side to it too. We were stuck at home, but we have time now to do some of the things that we love. And I get a, a lot of email also from people that are getting back into just playing again, guys that are, they're, they're retiring you know, 55, 60 years old. And uh, why not get the guys together and go out in the garage and play some of the songs we used to play and they're doing it all over the country. So it's a, there, there, are some, there are some bright spots in a, in a otherwise a dismal situation we're in. And I think it's gonna get better. I think we're gonna be fine. And I think uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I love that. Thank you so much for that amazing advice. Um, Ellen, do you have any last words that you wanna say we're gonna wrap up this video we're gonna tell all your fans hello Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, any last words thank you thank you so much for having us it's a, it's always a pleasure knitting billy and sunshine and like it's it's, it's just a blast right i'm glad you were here you and alan both and uh get in touch with me soon and uh maybe we'll work together again now that helen helen took my base gig though i so so i <laughs> <laughs> let me know if you need me I, i'm there for you all great, right great everybody it has been such a fun time uh thank you again i can't say thank you enough i can't do it without all of you everybody please stay safe out there be kind you never know what other people are going through keep that smile on your face and keep it funky on that base <laughs> we'll see you right guys on. later thank you everyone Bye. thank you we'll talk soon all right take care